Good afternoon. Uh, you're very welcome. My name is Alex White, Director General of the Institute of International European Affairs. Welcome to my office. Um, this event uh, is the second in a series of webinars co-organized by the European Parliament Liaison Office in Ireland and the Institute, the IIEA, seeking to explore in depth a number of important critical issues relevant to the future of the European Union. Uh, these are democratic resilience, uh, digitalization and the future of work, and the energy transition. And in that context, we're looking at the important role the European Parliament plays in making progress with respect to uh, those questions. And um, we have an expert panel of speakers um, exploring how the European Union can help deliver a sustainable and just energy transition for the European Union and its member states and its citizens. And in that uh, context, discussing the crucial role that the European Parliament is playing uh, in this uh, transition. So just to let you know what's going to happen for the next hour or so, each of our three speakers will offer introductory remarks of up to about seven minutes or so, and then we go to a Q&A with the audience, with you. Uh, you'll be able to join the discussion uh, using the Q&A function on Zoom, which you'll see on your screen, and uh, feel free, as we always say, to send in, pop in your questions throughout the session according as they occur to you, rather than waiting until the very end, when sometimes questions tend to bunch up and one can't get around to them all. So if something occurs to you, uh, just pop it into the system and we'll come to it once our speakers have finished their introductory remarks. You can also participate in the discussion on Twitter by using the handle at IIEA. Um, today's presentations and the Q&A are all on the record, um, just as so you know that. Um, nothing secret here. Um, and now to our three speakers. I'll introduce each of them in a little more detail when, when I come to them, but just as you can probably see on screen, our three speakers, Kieran Cuff, MEP, uh, Claudia Gamun, uh, MEP, and Professor Lisa Ryan. So I'm going to come on the basis of alphabetical order, firstly, to Kieran Cuff. Kieran Cuff is a Green Party MEP for Dublin. He sits on the Committees for Energy, Transport and Regional Development, is president of Eufores, a European cross-party network that promotes the deployment of sustainable energy systems. He's currently the Rapporteur for the Revision of the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive, the EPBD. Prior to his election to the European Parliament in 2019, he served as a Dublin City Councillor, TD for Dunleary, and Minister of State with responsibility for sustainable transport and climate change. Um, and his CV ranges far wider and longer than that, but we just don't have the time to go through it all. So welcome, Kieran. The floor is yours, seven minutes or so. We look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thanks very much, Alex, and good to see you again and to be with the audience, including my colleague uh, from Austria. So uh, it's a pleasure to, to have you all online. Uh, if you don't mind, I will uh, share a screen, uh, if I can, and pull out a, a presentation, uh, which has, I think, just seven slides. So um, I will just see if I can find the presentation and it'll hopefully pop up. Uh, and there we go. Just saying OK to a few things and uh, slideshow from the start. There we go. Hopefully, Alex, you can see uh, yes, the yes, view can. that I see uh, yep. when I walk out from the European Parliament. Terrific. So that is uh, uh, both the, the literal view from Brussels, but I also want to give you, I guess, the metaphorical view from Brussels as to where uh, we are going with the uh, sustainable and uh, just uh, transition. So um, four years into uh, my mandate, uh, I would preface remarks by saying it has been a tumultuous uh, few years. I, in, in a sense, the, the three C's come to mind uh, that we started off with climate. Uh, we then entered six months later into a period of COVID uh, and a, a couple of years after that, a period of conflict uh, with Russia's murderous war uh, in Ukraine. The good news from my perspective is 
the green, the European Green Deal is still very much in play and continuing within the European Parliament. Uh, I think no one quite knew what was going to happen when COVID took hold. Uh, and then when conflict started on our eastern border, uh, there was again a level of uncertainty. But certainly with the repower EU plan coming from the European Commission and endorsed by the European Parliament, it is very clear that we need to accelerate our efforts to decarbonize at a European Union level, not just to save the planet, but to break ourselves away from dependency on Russia and other states that are run by oligarchs or dictators. So the Fit for 55, well, the European Green Deal, I guess, was what was announced uh, and which we voted for as parliamentarians, parliamentarians in the course of, of the year 2019. And even at that early stage, it broke down into a series of packages. Uh, I don't know how good your eyesight is. It's certainly straining mine to read the small print, but you can see in the bottom left-hand corner, CO2 emission standards for cars and vans. And you can see that it, that has become a, transported, a, a transformative piece of legislation, which we now call the ICE ban, the internal combustion engine ban, essentially the end of the production of vehicles, vans and cars that will run on fossil fuel by the year 2035. So you can see that individual elements of this European Green Deal are extraordinarily transformative in the coming decade. And in a nutshell, the name of the deal is about a 55%. Well, this translated into a, the Fit for 55 package of um, a series of measures that would reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by 55% uh, between the year 1990 and 2030. Is this ambitious? It certainly is. However, a lot has been done at a European Union level in the years between 1990 and, shall we say, 2020. Uh, that having been said, we still have to ramp up our efforts in the decade ahead. And that's why this Fit for 55 package of around 20 different pieces of legislation and there's, you know, in different colours, the different files that are being led by the Environment Committee, the ITRI or Energy Committee, uh, the Transport Committee down at the bottom, the Economic Affairs Committee. I've highlighted in yellow the one where I am the rapporteur or the lead negotiator, the recast energy performance of buildings uh, directive. But in every sector, from aviation to land use, we need to work hard at decarbonizing. And we also need to work hard at bringing citizens with, with us and ensuring that they have a just transition uh, as we move towards a lower uh, carbon economy. Two of the headline packages are the Renewables Energy Directive and the Energy Efficiency Directive. But these are backed up by new laws such as CBAM, the Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism to prevent imports into the European Union that are not paying a full price for carbon. And that graphic that I showed you in the previous slide of the honeycomb is very important to remember because this is a package that has to work vertically and horizontally. And I think what keeps the European Commission awake at night is the, the need to ensure that these legislative uh, pieces uh, of the jigsaw do not contradict each other are in, and are in harmony. And I think thus far, uh, we've done very, very well. The Fit for 55 package, there's the headlines, the Renewable Energy, the Energy Efficiency Directive. Um, all of these pieces of legislation are through or nearly through the legislative pipeline. Almost all of them have been voted on by the European Parliament. Some are still at trialogue stage where a deal is being hammered out between the European Commission, the Council, the relevant Council of, or the Council of relevant ministers, uh, and indeed the, the Parliament. Uh, with my own file, the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive, uh, our first trialogue takes place in three weeks' time on the 6th of June. But you can see another file below there on sustainable aviation fuels. We hammered out a deal at trialogue. Uh, a few weeks ago, it's coming back to the Parliament for a final vote in a few weeks' time. 
So most of these pieces of legislation are going through or are on the point of going through. A key issue, though, in all of this is the money. And this graphic produced by Renovate Europe um, in regard to my own file, you know, where do we find the money to renovate our buildings? And this generates newspaper headlines here at home in Ireland. Um, and one of the answers is through European funds. Uh, and a lot of the money may available at Europe already through the multi-annual financial framework can be made available for this particular issue of uh, renovating buildings. Uh, and it's interesting just looking at this kind of snapshot. We also have the, um, the recovery money from COVID, the recovery and resilience facility. In Ireland's case, that's just under a billion. But for a country like Italy, it amounts to about 70 billion euro. So the COVID recovery money is very significant for countries that suffered very badly during the COVID period. And then, of course, there are structural funds. There is the Just Transition Fund, Horizon Europe. We're seeing parts of that money being made available in Europe or in Ireland, not as much as in other countries, because let's face it, the, the economic performance of Ireland has been way ahead of most other countries who are dealt, who are dealing with challenging levels of unemployment, challenging levels of low or negative growth, and many of them would um, be envious of the challenges that we have here in, in uh, Ireland. An issue that does arise though, to my mind, is one of efficiency versus sufficiency. A lot of the legislation that we're dealing with is about improving the efficiency of cars, of buildings, and I think there is a debate that we need to have about sufficiency that made its way into the last climate change negotiations uh, in the Middle East last autumn. But it is hard to find a political majority for sufficiency, uh, which I think demands us to rethink our economic system somewhat. So for instance, on buildings, you can have a very large home that has a low energy use per square meter, but really you might ask yourself, do you need a three or four or 5,000 square foot home? And these are, I think, are some of the debates that we will have in, uh, the, in the coming years. Uh, and I think that needs to be part of the discussion that we will perhaps have in the next mandate of the parliament starting uh, next year. One final remark I would say is that I am, acutely conscious that I live in Brussels in an environment that very much focuses on environmental action. But the Green Group are only 10% of the Parliament. I would imagine, well, we know a majority of the Parliament are in favour of climate action, but perhaps not at the pace that I believe science demands. And you've seen a kickback or a pushback, should I say, on the, um, the European nature law, and on some other pieces of legislation that I would argue are integral parts of the European Green Deal. So in conclusion, I would say that challenges remain. There, are, there is a minority of political interests who oppose the European Green Deal. There is a majority in favor of it, but sometimes the support for the European Green Deal is lukewarm. And I think support particularly for the just transition measures such as the Social Climate Fund that will provide some of the monies to help those who have dif difficulty uh, in, in paying the price for the green transition. We need to do more in that area. We need to ensure that people are not left behind. And a, a, an environmental transition is of no use unless it comes with social safeguards that protect, protect those who are most at risk. Uh, as we move ahead on this journey. Last Friday, I was in Paris with the International Energy Agency, and I described what's happening in Europe as a gentle revolution. But Fatih Burrell, the head of the IEA, turned to me and said, it's not that gentle. It's quite bumpy at the moment, particularly because of what has happened in Ukraine. Uh, and as we move away from these energy sources from Russia and elsewhere, there have been 
price spikes, there have been challenges. So the outlook is not all positive, and I think it demands constant vigilance as we move forward. Kieran, thank you for that clear and succinct presentation. Very grateful for that. Um, I'm going to turn next to our uh, second speaker. Claudia Gamon is a member of the Industry Research MEP, is a member of the Industry Research and Energy Committee uh, of the European Parliament. He is the um, spokesperson for all EU-related issues um, for, new Aust for the new Austria and Liberal Forum, NEOS, and she sits with the Renew Europe Group uh, in the European Parliament. Previously, she represented NEOS as, I don't know if that's the way we should be pronouncing, N-E-O-S, NEOS, as a member of the Austrian Parliament. In her work, she focuses mainly on the topics of energy, climate policies, science, research, and technological progress. Uh, Claudia Gamon studied International Business Administration and International Management at the Vienna University of Economics and uh, in Louvain. She gained her first political experience in 2011 when she was the leading candidate for the Young Liberals in the Austrian Students' Union. So you're very, very welcome to this IIEA webinar, Claudia, and the floor virtually, the virtual floor is yours. And we look forward to what you have to say. Thank you very much, Alex. And, and, and thank you for the invitation and giving me the chance to, to speak today and to try and present, I guess, a view also from an MEP from another country, because I know that, I, I guess, uh, one of the challenges of the European Parliament is, of course, making the energy transition and making energy transition policies work for all member states. And I think we have seen, especially in the last years, the limitations of the energy union and, uh, and also maybe the potential that could be there with, uh, if we try to work together a little bit better in this regard. But I would like to give you maybe some insight in, into my views on this. And I want to, to, to thank my colleague, uh, Kieran Kuff, for, for his overview also on the files that he's working on and, and generally to give us an idea of how big uh, the European Green Deal is and how big this Fit for 55 legislation package has been. Um, because whenever I, I, I talk to people in my constituency here in the west of Austria, we have lots of hydropower and we have lots of pumped hydro storage. Uh, it's a very different situation, very privileged, I guess, geographically, um, the situation that we're in. And also when young climate activists come to talk to me and say nothing is happening on a member state level, I try and explain a lot is happening on the EU level. A lot is in progress, but it will unfortunately take some time until it reaches the member states and until it reaches member states um, legislation or legislative process. And that is something to consider, but I want to, I also want people to understand that there is a lot of change coming their way. A lot of change coming their way in terms of their own private home, the way where their energy comes from, what it will cost. A lot, a lot is happening and it's at a pace that has not been seen before in the European Union when it comes to energy and, and climate policy. And that's something that we have to get people ready for. And one of my biggest priorities always when I try to talk about the work that is important in energy policy is try and focus on the paradigm shift that we're seeing in the energy transition and what comes with it when we move from a centralized fossil-based energy production system to a renewable space and in its nature decentralized system that comes with lots of changes, not just for the European Union, for the member states, for regulators, but also for communities at the local level. The potential that it could mean for rural, de uh, rural development and, and the, I guess also the challenges that the communities will have and how to best manage the new decentralized nature and, and the, the potential that it could have for local communities. And this all starts with the energy infrastructure. And for that, there is lots of investment needed in the European Union in order to support um, the new nature or the, this new paradigm that we live in in the, in the renewables-based system, I guess, of today and in the future. And then I worked on 
on some legislation that has to do strictly with uh, with cross border infrastructure. So I mean, it's all technical nonsense, but in this case, it's called it's the the ten E legislation that deals with the cross border energy infrastructure, and. Uh, the, the view that it gave me is that we have so much to do with that part of energy policy. Okay, so I, I do believe that there is a huge investment gap when it comes to energy infrastructure, but also in terms of under, uh, the, the member states, regions and local communities understanding the size of the investment gap and what will be needed to really ensure that local communities can benefit from the energy transition. And that will that actually brings me to to something that that my colleague mentioned, and that is what's the other side of the parliament? What's hindering us in going further and and really pushing the agenda forward? And that is the fact that well, elections do matter. The majorities in the European Parliament do matter. And even though um, the Commission and I guess all the institutions that try to be um, as objective as one can be in these questions. I mean, uh, there's no true objectivity in this, but I guess we can, we can try to act as, as, as objectively as we can, that there is, for example, no further need for natural gas infrastructure, as an example. There is still a lot of public money that goes into new infrastructure where I think we might as well be burning it somewhere else because the gap and the needs that we have in the future of our energy system is so big that every euro spent on new um, fossil infrastructure for me is, is a euro wasted on the past. Um, something else that I would like to mention um, because I'm working on it currently and it's one of the big parts also of, of Fit for 55 is the revision of the gas and hydrogen market. And it's also just as relevant uh, for Ireland as it is for all the other countries because it does have to do with the future of heating. And what we have, or what I have been trying to do is to make it a package that is also about decarbonizing the gas system and giving people a way out of gas and making it fit for purpose for local communities so they can use energy systems integration, that they can use heating, um, sustainable heating that they might have available locally, but it's a question of know-how, it's a question of integration, and it's a question of, I guess, reducing administrative hurdles, administrative burdens that make it too complex and too complicated for people to really have access to the potential that is there. And while I would disagree with my colleague when he says that the big question is the money, I do know that for individuals, for consumers, the big question is the money, but I think for, um, for those that have to bring um, the companies that work in the system and the people that want to make it a legislative reality at home, it's a question of, of making it as easy as possible. And we have to deal with so much bureaucracy that is in the way of of, um, of keeping up the pace um, of the energy transition that it really angers me. And personally, I think that it's, it's about making it easier, making it more accessible to more people, to more businesses, and, and, and just, you know, doing some, sometimes it's also about doing a bit less in Brussels, and regulating a bit less in some areas. Um, so maybe this is also something where, truly liberal policies do meet with truly green policies in the way that we have the same goal and, and can, uh, can relate in the same way. Um, yeah, I think uh, I shouldn't talk too long. So this is it for me. And, uh, and my focus is, uh, as I said, that the, the paradigm shift that I want to explain to people that will come with the energy transition and the potential that it could bring for local communities. Thank you very much, uh, Claudia, for that um, an interesting uh, point at the end that it's not so much about the money, it's about um, making it as easy as possible. And then that does raise, of course, pretty profound questions in relation to the nature of regulation and 
what is sought to be achieved by regulation, and I suppose in some people's minds anyway, the necessity of regulation, but you're making the opposite, or sort of making a, a, a different emphasis, which is that perhaps um, in some instances, the regulation is too burdensome, would you say? Um, but maybe we we'll get a chance to explore some of those points in the Q&A. So our third um, speaker, um, Lisa Ryan, is Professor in Energy Economics in the School of Economics at University College Dublin. Uh, Lisa's research is in clean energy technology adoption, energy markets, and climate change economics and related policy. She's an active member of the UCD uh, Energy Institute, where she co-leads the interdisciplinary Empower project relating to the decarbonization of electricity and consumer technologies in climate change mitigation policy. Lisa is a principal investigator in the flagship Nexus project. She was the senior energy economist in the energy efficiency unit at the International Energy Agency in Paris, the second mention today of the that August institution until summer 2013, where she led research projects relating to energy efficiency, finance, transport, and cross sectoral policy. Um, Lisa, over to you. Look forward to what you have to say. Thank you very much, Alex, and thank you overall for the invitation to speak at this event. Um, it's, I'm delighted to be involved in a policy discussion get me out of my academic ivory tower where I've been since 2016 and I still take a lot of my research I have to say it's in you know technology adoption but always in the context of um, policy analysis um, and so of course in Ireland a lot of our policy is coming from Europe so I follow closely the developments at a European level and um, Kieran Cut started the, you know by introducing the Green Deal and the Fit for 55 legislation. When I started thinking about this talk today, I, I start I, I panicked a little thinking, where do I begin? Because as he already stated, it is such a broad package. And the Fit for 55 has all the legislative measures. I had a quick look earlier to see where we are at with those legislative measures. And I think of the 58 in the train, uh, this is Euro talk for me. Um, you know, about 40 have departed, but there's still quite a few that have to go. But that just shows you the scale of the legislation that is required to be implemented to achieve some of this, um, these very ambitious targets. From my perspective and from the, I think the discussion today, the three big targets are the CO2 emissions ones at 55% reduction, the renewable energy target that has now gone to 40% by 2030, and the energy efficiency target, which I still call 38% reduction. It seems that now it's we're, we're quoting it in different terms, but it is hugely ambitious, all by 2030. And um, from an Irish perspective, we have translate we are translating these into um, uh, you know Irish policy via the Climate Action Plan. And um, there we are really betting very heavily on the electrification of, let's just say it, nearly everything. Um, we have, you know, we are well above our targets for um, CO2 emissions. We have a carbon budget that's meant to be achieved by 2020, our first carbon budget that we are running ahead of. Um, and we are betting heavily that we are going to electrify heat and transport and we are going to decarbonize the electricity sector. So I'm paying very close attention, I suppose, at a European level, what is going to happen with um, electricity. Um, I think this year we have seen with, I mean, even pre the Ukraine crisis, um, we, we could see that electricity prices have been rising um, as a result of gas prices rising after the post COVID um, situation where economic activity took off again. So already from September, 2021, you saw natural gas prices rising. And, you know, I agree with Claudia that normally we should not be supporters of natural gas. It is a carbon based fuel. But in the Irish context where we're trying to switch to renewables and we don't really have, we have very little interconnection. We are very reliant on natural gas as being our cleanest fossil fuel. So when natural gas prices start to rise and 50% of our electricity is being generated from natural gas, it does mean that our electricity prices really start to take off. Um, and I do worry about this from a consumer perspective. A lot of my research is on consumer technology adoption. The problem is that as we're encouraging people to, to take on heat pumps or electric vehicles, it's really not helpful when um, electricity prices become um, very high. They've doubled in Ireland as they have in many European countries. So I think one of the things I'm paying close attention to is the electricity market reform, which um, is, you know, we already had um, some proposals now that came out in March 2023 from um, the Commission. 
the I would regard these measures as a kind of a half a half step in a way. I think that we all agree that we have an electricity market situation where we're it's it's a paradigm shift, just like Claudia said where we are switching from a fossil fuel based system to a renewables based system and our electricity markets are not fit for purpose in that regard when you have um, no marginal costs associated with electricity generation we have fixed costs and so the the proposals that are there are starting to address this but they're really recommendations we should have more fixed costs we should have more power purchase agreements rather than a fundamental reform and this will take a lot of time it took ireland about a decade to implement the current electricity market structure and it took about a decade for that to be designed so it will take a long time but i think that's something that we would really that really needs to get going um, we have the clean energy package in place since 2019. There are eight directives there already. And I think that's something that will continue to be, uh, well, revisited now. I, I sometimes look at the poor European Parliament. It seems that, uh, you know, not a, once, uh, you know, the, the even the EPBG or the renewables directive, they haven't, the old versions haven't been there very long. And we're already having to rescope, re renegotiate um, all of those targets and with not just the targets, but the measures that we need to implement them. Um, so there have been a few uh, legislative changes this year and regulatory changes um, as a result of the um, energy crisis. We've seen the intervention measures that came in, in September 2023, Repower EU and this, I, I call it the minor electricity market reform, although that may not make people very happy. Um, Repower EU was quite interesting in that it I suppose it is very much aligned with, um, you know, trying to diversify away from fossil fuels. So we're killing a few birds with one stone, diversifying where are also the existing fossil fuels are coming from and um, trying to uh, boost industrial decarbonization. But one that I thought was very interesting that was there was trying to improve permitting. And this will come back to uh, Claudia's point on infrastructure. Um, as I say, we're betting very heavily on electricity and we're not the only country doing so. Um, and this will require offshore wind. This will require, but also interconnection. It will require a lot more reinforcement of wires. In Ireland, we're trying for about a decade now, we are trying to build an inter, just a big wire between North and South and we have huge problems doing so. So without uh, some kind of streamlining of the permitting and planning, and I think this is extraordinarily difficult to do, every country seems to be facing it, we are going to be stuck and mired in um, planning difficulties that will mean that will hinder our switch over to a renewable electricity. Um, but overall, I think that we, the crisis that we've seen in the last year has hopefully among the wider population reinforced the idea that Firstly, domestic energy supplies are something that are to be favoured. Renewables meets that. Fossil fuels and geopolitically, they are very difficult to, to control, basically, because they're outside the European Union. Um, and that electricity is extremely important and we need to get it right. So hopefully, I'm, I'm more hopeful, I think, that the general population will be supportive of um, a switch to renewables and also the infrastructure around this that is required. I was very happy this week in Ireland where we had our first offshore wind um, auction results and the price, although it's discussed in the media quite a bit, has, is more favourable than I think most would have expected at 86 euros a megawatt hour. So things are progressing in the right direction, but I do worry a lot about uh, how fast we can get things built by 2030. And I also have to say that I have changed my mind a little bit on the natural gas situation, Claudia, that although I really don't like seeing natural gas or any more investment in any kind of fossil fuel, I don't see a way around it in countries like Ireland where we um, need some kind of short-term gain. Um, so I wouldn't like to see long-term infrastructure being built, but I think we will need to have some natural gas capacity in the short term to facilitate this transition. And I think that's what I'm stuck with now. Thank you very much, um, Lisa, for that, for those insights. Um, and you, you mentioned planning difficulties and sort of capacity issues there towards the end of, of, of your, your presentation. And I wonder, um, because we hear so much about that now, about the sort of bottlenecks in the system, your know, difficulty in supply chain in respect of renewables and so on. A lot of people talking about problems of capacity and ability to deliver, not just in Ireland, but in many countries, including countries that might sometimes be seen as more advanced than us. I mean, Kieran, what, what, how 
critical or how much of a problem or how big of an obstacle in broad brush terms do you think the capacity of, we'll come back in a minute to the willingness and the political question, but the actual, as it were, engineering technical capacity of modern states to, to actually do this transition. How big of a question is that, do you think? Well, I think for Ireland, the, the prospect of, of offshore wind is a hugely important one. And I think we are building bigger and more challenging in more challenging locations than we have ever done mm. that having been said i actually don't think the engineering challenges are the difficulty i uh, i think uh, as the other speakers alluded to the the regulatory process is is a bigger challenge i think within ireland we often say planning is a problem we need to make planning easier the more challenging issue is to address the lack of resources in the planning field. Uh, I know I bring my own bias in here because I'm trained as a planner, uh, but I think we do need more staff in our national uh, planning um, agency in, in Board Planola, but we also need more staff at a local authority level within the national parks and wildlife services within the areas that will be impacted by this transformation, it could be marine life, it could be um, it, it could be uh, land species on land, but we need to analyze the impact that we will have. All of that having been said, there is a move to simplify the regulatory process at a European level. Franz Timmermans, the executive vice president of the Commission, talks about this all the time, and some of the examples he uses is, for instance, the replacement of a wind farm with taller turbines. And I think that's a reasonable request to allow a bit more flexibility uh, within the planning process to allow for some expansion of what we all uh, already have. I'm not sure if Ireland is unique in all of this, but I do know for some of the smaller infrastructure projects, sometimes we have to produce as many as 20 different reports. And I certainly think at a European Union level, there needs to be more joined up thinking between the different legislation that would certainly make the path smoother and hopefully perhaps a bit faster. Picking up on that, uh, Claudia, just on the, the regulation and um, your point about that it should be made, it should be made easier, for things to happen should be perhaps facilitate developments should be facilitated in a, uh, uh, to to progress more quickly um, and reflecting on what Kieran just said there is there though on the other side of the coin the risk of clashing with you know citizens interests citizens groups um, residents in rural areas you know indeed even in urban areas who obviously uh, will want to influence candidates in European elections and indeed in other elections in the coming months and years is there a is there inevitably a clash there simplifying the planning system making it happen more quickly and then on the other side the demands of citizens to be heard in relation mm. to infrastructure um, yeah, I mean, I understand the connection because this is also how the planning process in Austria works, for example, and this is part of the reason why these processes in permitting take so long. But I think we have to accept that they should have relatively little to do with each other. I think in order to really guarantee acceptance for renewables expansion, because they are visible, in a very different manner as, as the fossil-based infrastructure was visible. It is visible, it is part of the landscape, and you can just imagine, I live in the, I live in the Alps. People say they're not ready to see uh, wind turbines on mountains, but then again, why not? I mean, it's a, I, I think the way to go about local um, questions or, or fears that people have is to, is to, is a different way of, of, of public policy making. It's an open process. It's involving people very early. It's explaining goals, it's leadership. And I think very often, especially at the local level, 
um, we don't prioritize um, bringing people into the process. We don't prioritize public forums. We don't prioritize um, an early integration of communities into the planning process. And also, and that is, for example, if I compare the Swiss model to the Austrian model, in Switzerland, there is a huge focus on making local communities benefit financially from energy projects. And I know that this isn't, this is something that many EU member states might have to get into, but I do think that there is a, that there is value added in explaining to local communities, you can invest, you can make it part of, of the business of your local community, you can make people benefit from it. And I see a huge potential in there, but I think this is smart and good policy making and a different way of, of going about anything in politics, to be honest. Any big change has to come with an open, integrated process. And the permitting should be about regulation. The permitting should be about what is possible and what is necessary to do. And I see a difficulty actually in, in the way in where we leave space for member states to overregulate and where we overregulate on the European level. I would much rather have clear policy making on the European level in what is necessary in the permitting processes, but we give the member states so much space and setting up a wind farm in Austria can take up to two to three, I think, no, I think the maximum right now that we're having is seven years. That is ridiculous. It's ridiculous for something, especially if you look at what is, what is the, what is the, the greatest benefit of renewables is that it's really quick to scale them up if you do it correctly. So we're actually missing the point of a renewables expansion that we have, we don't have enough time to wait so long. And, and of course, Lisa, there's also the question of grid infrastructure, which is also a, a, a major perhaps consideration for well for some citizens anyway if it's if it's to be located near them um and we we had going back five or six years I had some involvement in it myself some you know a much public controversy here in relation to um frankly what is seen by many as quite necessary grid infrastructure that we're going to need not least north south um and that that's um that's been slow as well hasn't it it has, it, it, you know, it, it comes back to the same thing of encouraging people to understand and educating people about what the benefits are. Um, just taking one step back in terms of the planning whole um, area there, I am a little bit more hopeful in terms of offshore wind. And I think that's one of the reasons people are in, in, encouraging for offshore wind now. In Ireland, we've only had one offshore wind farm, so we'll, we'll see. But I, I also think, although we've been a bit slow getting started, I do quite like the, the, the way that we are, it's centrally led at the moment. So it's a different uh, way of doing things that it won't be just mm. ad hoc developer led. So we're designating <clears throat> areas where we think a wind, offshore wind farm should go. And I, I sat in on a call, um, I have a PhD student who's just starting to look at this area of acceptance of offshore wind among coastal communities. And um, there are different areas, there will be other problems with offshore wind, there may be, you know, environmental issues, there may be uh, fishing issues, so there may be other people who are not as happy than the communities. But the communities that I sat in with on a kind of a, they were having a conversation, a consultation, on um, offshore winds that were that may be located near them was so positive they couldn't they were thinking about all the different opportunities that were going to be there and um, they were hoping about the community benefit fund that has not yet been designed but again coming back to some kind of financial gain but just the general economic activity that was going to be generated uh, through it so um is there it, it, things may not be always as dire as we sometimes portray them and and also with I agree totally with uh, Kieran Cuff that I think the on board planola has been under-resourced and um, they seem to be at least that's what I'm being told that more people are being um, hired but particularly people with expertise that is a problem that we don't have that many people who know about offshore wind just because we haven't had that sector so and um, you know there's going to be a new regulatory agency Mara as well that's in the process of getting set up so I you know it, it seems that some of these issues are being addressed albeit a little bit late but if they can get going we may be able to address some of them but then after that the grid infrastructure Yes, this is going to be very important. But 
one thing we have to always look at what is the smartest way to do it and let's not do unnecessary grid infrastructure and try and reduce our demand at peak times so that we don't have to build extra capacity and reinforce grids that are only there because they're used for a half hour um, every day in winter time so there are some things that we really need to make sure we have a handle on because grid infrastructure is difficult to reinforce it's expensive and it is, you know, it, there's big wires, there's small wires, it goes right out to every neighborhood when everybody's electrified. So we'll need to make sure that ESP networks and air grid who are going to be really carrying out this grid infrastructure and um, have a handle on where it's, you know, how can we do this in the smartest way? Sure. A question for the two parliamentarians. Well, Lisa, we you, happy for you to comment on it as well from what you've observed. But just again, in relation to the role of the parliament, if you both would, would the European Parliament both reflect on that. I mean, a question that's been suggested to me here is if you thought or if the parliament had a greater role in the legislative pro uh, process than it currently does, would we see more or less progress? towards the, the fit for 55 targets, for example. In other words, is the parliament of the EU decision-making institutions, and it's play, obviously it has an important role in, in the decision-making infrastructure, um, is the parliament a progressive uh, force for change or is it sometimes a block on change? And how, what, how do you reflect on, on the parliament from being in it in, in terms of its role in this, on this agenda? Claudia first, maybe. I'm a bit conflicted on this. I'm not mm. sure if it would be if it would be any better if we had a bigger role because what I did notice uh, with many of the different Fit for 55 files is that it was hugely dependent on the group of negotiators, on the individuals, on the rapporteur, on on the shadow rapporteurs from the groups, and that has to do with with uh, the, the parliamentary groups being very. Um, very non-homogenous, actually, especially when it comes to climate policies. It's the case with different policies as well, but in terms of climate, um, the, the, um, the borders within the groups follow a different kind of logic than they would do in other, in other policy areas. And I think this might change over time. But this, this focus on the Green Deal in the legislative nature, everything also in, in politics, the pace of the change has increased rapidly in the last five years. And the changes also that parties had to recognize, that policymakers had to recognize on how parties in all European member states had to adapt their, their programs, their agendas in order to reflect the need also coming from, um, coming from the public. And so you really see the files where you have a skilled negotiator, somebody who can really, who's, who, who is able to, to make it an inclusive process of bringing people in, who's a great whip also when it comes to bringing in the votes for the final vote. So I, I, it really depends. But on the other hand, I think it's just how democracy works and how parliamentarism is supposed to work. Mm -hmm. It really does matter. And, who the individual MEP is and who's elected. Kieran? Yeah, I think it does vary um, depending on the file. I think the general view is that the parliament is usually a bit more progressive than council or the commission. Uh, but at times I've seen the commission and indeed council be more progressive than the parliament. I, I think Claudia is absolutely right. Uh, we're always watching who has got that file, who's leading, who's shadowing, uh, and that tells you an awful lot. And there can be a groan of despair or a cry of, of relief, depending on who, which political group and which, which negotiator, almost more importantly, uh, is, is in charge. I mean, without naming names, I was shadowing on uh, an own initiative report. This is not legislation, but it's reports that the parliament produces on urban mobility. And I was dealing with a very conservative uh, rapporteur who didn't want to have a hierarchy of who should access urban areas. So cars and pedestrians should be put on the same basis. That really stemmed from the rapporteur and I could not change their view. So I, I think a, a good um, MEP can really um, navigate 
through the complexities of the different institutions. Uh, and I guess we rely on the political groupings putting forward progressive leaders for these files. And there is a few shadows. There are a few shadows on the horizon uh, with the move to the far right in certain uh, countries that could end up blocking some climate legislation in the next mandate. Uh, and that, that is a concern. It is certainly a shadow on the horizon. Lisa, um, I'll go to you first in this question, but I will come back to Kieran Cuff because it relates to something that he said. Uh, Owen Lewis, who's the co-chair of our climate and energy group here at the Institute, he reminds us that Kieran made an important point concerning new Irish dwellings and neighbourhoods. Good Irish progress in bear ratings is being made, but how will you address all of this if the dwellings are twice as large as the European norm and four times less dense? Uh, thanks, Alex. I think we're back to again are we <laughs> um it, it, he, he's completely right we have very large one you know uh, one-off housing scattered around the country poorly planned it has to be said um it costs a lot to build the infrastructure both uh, to to connect them both electricity water all the other infrastructure that you need the other issue associated with those large dwellings is that the older ones we have a huge number of uh, dwellings that have oil fired heating. I think that's the largest in, largest share in Europe as well. Um, so, I mean, just tackling that, first of all, and, and also we still have houses that don't even have central heating that are still using a solid fuel to heat their homes. So if, if it were me, I would be trying to target um, those larger dwellings with oil fired heating and solid fuel heating. And they are not going to ever be connected to a gas grid probably at this stage. They should be targeted for heat pumps and renovation. Um, obviously, you have to renovate and bring their energy consumption down before you can uh, put in the heat pump. But I think that, and a lot of this is about rural Ireland as well. And so unfortunately, we start getting into this uh, apparent conflict between, you know, you know, rural Ireland being made to, to make their dwellings smaller and, you know, being, uh, it, it generates this kind of conflict. And I think one way around that would be to, you know, give different grants to different uh, areas, depending on your situation, you know, similarly would be for transport. These are areas of Ireland that are never going to have public transport either. They should get a different grant to somebody in an urban area, perhaps for an EV. Similarly, they should be maybe given a preferential grant for a renovation um, uh, uh, and a heat pump, because we will also get bigger bang for our buck because they're switching from oil rather than an urban dweller again, who might be switching just from a quite an efficient gas condensing boiler. So how do we, so that's the main thing I would do. It's quite difficult to decide the size of a dwelling. I think there is a lot of planning restriction now in place in terms of just this urban or just building um, houses in, uh, in new areas that are not uh, well serviced. And this is causing conflict. Uh, people don't like it if, if people are from a particular area. But I think that's something, unfortunately, we do have to continue with because it's not sustainable to keep building in one-off greenfield sites. Karen? Yeah, um, this, this is a challenging one. And those who have recently railed against the 15-minute city and low-traffic neighbourhoods, if they get a whiff of a suggestion that we wish to suggest to them what size their home might be i can only imagine the protests that we we might get on that one look this for many this the the transition is challenging and it's not just moving away from oil it's from wood to oil to gas to electricity i was in a conversation with the German housing minister yesterday, she said, we don't want to push older people away from using wood to heat their homes. And obviously in, in Austria, uh, wood biomass is, is, is hugely important. So we have to gently move people in the right direction. And the point I think that Lisa made about high cost of electricity, it reminds me of the sign in the local barbers, a, a a, a cheap haircut is not good. A, a good haircut is not cheap. And when it comes to energy, we want prices that are not cheap, but that are affordable. Uh, and I, I think this is the, the dilemma with the reform of the electricity market. We want to ensure that we move towards renewables to produce this electricity, but we don't want to absolutely favour 
short term reductions in prices in order to achieve that. Because if we do, we would just build more more gas um, uh, power generators. So we absolutely need to find the sweet spot that brings the transition at the rate that is needed, but that also brings people with us. Uh, and I think often the local conversations that we would have, as Claudia would know, in Austria or here in Ireland, to show that there's a community benefit, to bring people on this journey. I mean, literally, I often describe the huge offshore wind farm that I often see in North Wales from the train, Gwinty Moor. And I think it's beautiful. And I had similar discussions 15 years ago when we were bringing back electric trams to Dublin and people said, the overhead wires, they're awful. And I said, look, when I see those wires, I know the air is cleaner to breathe because it's not burning diesel to, to move people around. But we need to constantly uh, communicate why the transition is needed. Uh, and bring people with us on this journey. Okay, to finish, and um, we only have a few minutes, um, I'm conscious that uh, we're all conscious that there's been quite a step change in the US um, approach to, um, for example, investment, a much more interventionist um, approach taken by um, President Biden and I suppose by extension, the Congress, although there's obviously conflict there, but there's a big uh, shift in um, the American, the approach in the US, um, and for example, quite hefty subsidies to um, particular sectors um, that are so critical uh, to this agenda. I'm wondering, do you do do you think any all three of you? And I might just stay with Kieran if you like, because I'll be finishing on this question. So I'll start with you and go finish up with the with the, with the colleagues. Do you think that Europe? Um, how shall I put it? Has anything to learn from that shift, um, which perhaps we wouldn't certainly wouldn't have expected from an American government in in the last decade or so, and we now see it, um, uh, we now see it um, really in very stark terms. What's your observation on that, and do you think it will catch on in Europe? I I think it will, and I think in its simplest form. They used more carrots. They are using more carrots than sticks in the United States. I was in the Tesla factory in Berlin. They said, look, we're not investing anymore in Germany because of the attractive um, uh, discounts we now have in the United States. So I think that is a lesson. It feeds into Claudia's point about regulation. Um, we In Brussels, we if something isn't moving, we tend to bring in uh, a law to make sure it happens. But I think in the United States, they're much focused more on a tax break. Uh, so I think there probably is something that we need to bring home from the IRA uh, in the United States and apply to our own way of working in Brussels. Claudia? I, I agree with Kieran, and I, I guess what we see is that there's lots of money going around in Europe but it's so tough to access it. It's so bureaucratic to access the European funds. I have met so many companies who say they would never apply for a European grant because they can't afford to employ, to employ somebody just to fill out the forms. And that is ridiculous. And I think what the US is showing us is the power of really using a part of your federal level that is strong in the right places. If anything, I think it should be for us an argument for stronger European integration where it benefits everybody. If we want to make these processes less bureaucratic, we might need a little bit more of a stronger federal European level in certain aspects to be able to make it less bureaucratic. But the problem is a, a is one of, of, of of arguments on uh, where does the, the competence lie when it comes to tax matters and so on and so on. But nobody, no, I don't think that any consumer or any, any company, any European company really cares about the institutional question of uh, co uh, co uh, a fight about competencies between the member states and the European Union. They just want, if there's money, we should have easy access to it and not make it as complex as it is in the European Union. And that is, I think, a really 
yeah that is it's actually so sad it makes me so angry that this is this is how we're losing against uh, in comparison to the united states and we should definitely take a page out of their book when it comes to being unbureaucratic when it matters lisa do you have a, any thoughts on well, I'd like to reassure our two parliamentarians that I think, you know, us, we Europeans are, are, are doing very well and I'm very glad to be part of Europe and not part of the US. So they, there may be some examples um, here where they've, you know, they're putting in initiatives, but let's be honest, some of these things that are already in Europe, like the INRA um, infrastructure and the money that's going in there are some things that we're already doing. Saying that, there are some things that I really like in the US that it's not necessarily new. Um, the, the, in energy efficiency finance, they have great schemes and they're at local level rather than uh, the federal level where you can, you know, the, where the loan stays tied to the property, it's paid back via your property tax or paid back via your energy bills. And that's the kind of thing that they seem to be honest to do at a municipal level or a state level. And people understand it over there and it's via a tax break. And so that we get over these, all these high costs that consumers um, can't get into the high upfront costs associated with the transition. So I suppose I, I quite like some of those, uh, maybe the, it's the autonomy of municipalities, but if they're given the freedom at federal level and the backing at federal level to put some of these schemes in place that I would like to see more of. And maybe some education among them, the consumers of how they work and not to be afraid of loans tied to properties. Um, but I think overall, the European Parliament is driving extremely ambitious targets. Um, it's not easy. I think everybody knows that the transition is going to cause, it's changing society. That's never going to be easy. So we all just have to work very hard in our own little areas to try and achieve this. Well, there is a, a nice strong endorsement for the European Parliament from an independent uh, observer. Um, Professor Lisa Ryan, Claudia Gamun, and Kieran Cuff, thank you very much for your participation this afternoon, for your presentations, and for the discussion. I certainly found it very stimulating and very insightful uh, on all your parts. Thank you, in particular, to the European Parliament Liaison Office uh, in Ireland uh, for their support for this webinar. And thank you, uh, if you have been, for watching and listening, and quite a few of you have. And we look forward to seeing you all again very soon. Thank you and good day.